Thank you uh, for everyone for being here, and thank you uh, to the speaker for vesting the Judiciary Committee with the uh, authority to, uh, to look into something that's very critical to uh, the state of New Jersey, both as it relates to this particular site and as it relates to uh, our perspective uh, on a going forward basis as to how we're going to deal with uh, individuals who pollute uh, our environment. And I'm, I'm going to ask you all for a deference, knowing for about five or six minutes I want to set us up the best we can as to uh, what the goals are of the committee and, and what this is all about. So the Bayway, just as it relates to, to the history, uh, if you don't already know, is, is a total of about 1,600 acres, 1,300 acres in Linden uh, and 220 acres, uh, 228 acres in Bayonne. Uh, the Linden site has been operated as a refinery from 1909 through 1972. Uh, it was sold uh, in 1993, and, and the Bayonne site, it goes back to actually 1879 through 1972, where it was operated as a refinery. Uh, beyond the refinery, at some point in the 1950s, that was interconnected between those two particular towns that, you know, that sits on the, uh, the, the Hudson estuary. Uh, there were petrochemical plants that were involved, there were sh smelting facilities, uh, you name it, it happened there. Uh, the owner, if you will, a responsible party uh, relative to, to that history of operation is ExxonMobil. I believe Phillips Conoco owns it currently, but the uh, circumstances regarding the uh, pollution are the responsibility of, of that company and all of its predecessors, I guess, that go back to, uh, to Standard Oil. Uh, I'm not going to get into the great ecological detail, but, but keep in mind over 7 million, 7 million gallons uh, of petrochemicals uh, were spread throughout that site through that period of time. Uh, liquid plumes uh, that uh, were the contaminants were taken, I think, on 17 different uh, readings and occasions into the uh, aquifer of Bayonne's groundwater. Uh, you know, anything from chromium to arsenic to mercury, uh, toxic substances, whether they're compounds or chemicals, uh, are replete throughout that, uh, that section. I don't think there's any argument uh, about any of that. So, so how do we find ourselves here? Going back to what was the public trust document in 1977, this legislature went forward with something known as the Spill Act. Uh, and the Spill Act required that polluters like this restore and replace and clean up the, uh, the, the, the ecological hazards uh, that they created. Uh, in 1979, the, the legislation was, was amended and all the way to 1990 when a component was added known as, we all say, NRD, but it's natural resource damages. And, and, and what was that? It was an expansion on just cleanup, really frankly, to create a hammer uh, on behalf of the people of the state of New Jersey uh, to get individuals who were polluters to clean up sooner uh, as well as to, again, compensate the, uh, the state uh, re and the people of the state relative to the damage that, uh, that was done. So what NRD did was, A, number one, said there had to be remediation. The Spill Act always did. Basically, there had to be clean up the standards. It said there had to be restoration. And what restoration meant is that primary restoration, meaning it had to return to preconditioned discharge. That makes sense, right? And then the third part was, was replacement. Now, the first two, remediation, meaning the clean up and restoration, you know, primary restoration, are really the economic damages, you know, if you will. This is what it's going to cost to clean up. This is what it's going to cost to restore it as to the way it used to be. The third part are really the, the, uh, the non-economic damages, the, the replacement of services. There's a large time frame going back 125 years when the 14 million people alone that live in the Hudson Raritan estuary were without all of the benefits of that ecosystem. You know, anything from, you know, uh, the, the, the human use, the, the, the flood and surge pretension, the, the, the habitat. So that's what that third component of the statute was about. That is the state law. So those three things. So let's fast forward a few years to 2002. And Governor McGreevy, uh, with uh, Commissioner Brad Campbell, uh, went forward with an initiative saying, hey, we're going to look at all the sites throughout the state of New Jersey, and we're going to use NRD, if you will, as the hammer to get them cleaned up. Uh, and to be able to get just compensation. And what we're going to do is we're going to open up a two-year period for the polluters, the bad actors, to, to, to come forward and, and agree with us. 
let's, this isn't about wanting to litigate for 12 years. We don't want to litigate. What we want to do is we want you to resolve and settle this with us. And many, many of the bad actors made those settlements, resulting in a lot of cleanups that wouldn't have already or otherwise happened without the NRD hammer that was out there. Well, one of the bad actors uh, who decided not to make an agreement or deal was ExxonMobil relative to the Bayway site, which by far is really the worst ecological site. And that's saying something, frankly, as far as the history of New Jersey and a lot of the Superfund sites, sadly, that have been here, the Passaic River and many of the other sites, but, but the largest by far. And ExxonMobil in 2004, if that was even their name then, said that they were going to they were going to stonewall. They weren't making any deal. So henceforth, basically 12 years of incredibly contestuous litigation. 2007, the appellate division said and made it clear in 2007 that ExxonMobil would be responsible for the second two parts of those damages, the primary restoration as well as the replacement services. So the, and it went to the appellate courts, cert was denied by the Supreme Court, so that changed. We won, the state won, as of that fight that Exxon went forward. They continued to litigate, and in 2009, the state won again because ExxonMobil was saying, well, listen, we may be responsible. That might be what that finding is, but it will only be, it can only be from 2002 forward or 1999 forward, whatever they would try to say as it relates to when the, there were amendments to those laws. The court said, no, uh-uh. You're responsible under the law retroactively back to the time when this occurred and for that whole and complete period. So what happened, the state's case continues to get stronger. And as it became stronger and as the state continued to be stonewalled, they went forward with a damages trial, a damages only trial with liability having been established. That damages only trial, very capably handled by outside counsel and a combination of internal professionals out of the Attorney General's office, went on for 55 trial days three, four months, whatever it might have been. Final briefs, which, you know, I'm bleary-eyed for a reason that I've gotten through. There are about 800 pages of briefs, which I appreciate the AG's office uh, cooperation in providing that to us to preliminarily take a look at, uh, were finalized uh, in November. It's my own subjective view reading those briefs, uh, and not all that subjective, having heard from some of the attorneys that have been involved, the state's case went in very, very well. Components of the Exxon experts admitted uh, before the trial judge on damages only that there were components of the statute that they didn't look to as it related to the, uh, the, uh, the, the statutory damages guidelines based on their reports that they put forward. Now, what report did the state put forward? The state during that trial, principally with a number of experts, utilized a, a world-renowned expert, Dr. John Lippman. And Dr. John Lippman put into evidence, under the rigors of trial, $2.63 billion as it related just to primary restoration, just to putting things back the way that they were before the bad actor polluted to the extent they did. And another $6.3 billion and some change relative to compensatory restoration for those 100 years or so. And, and it gets very complicated. He didn't always use 1869. There were a lot of different benchmarks depending on the type of damages it was. But the bottom line is the state put in an expert that did an excellent job and an excellent presentation showing $9 billion of damages after this three-month trial or 55 trial day trial. And thus, was, was a settlement. This hearing isn't about, certainly not at this phase, as, as to who negotiated the settlement and for what reasons or any kind of motivations. I'm not touching any of that. We're just going to look to the merits of this settlement. And the nine billion that was up on the board after 12 years of contestuous litigation was settled for 225 million. And that's where we, uh, where we find ourselves. Now, we haven't seen the, the full complete detail of the, of the settlement. We've seen 
different things come through the press and otherwise, we know that it will be published no later than April 8th. It could have been before, it could be tomorrow. Uh, I was hoping that it would be published before this hearing, which would make our job uh, and our task even more defined and, and more clear. Uh, and so we don't have those details, but we did get a letter from the Attorney General making it clear that primary restoration is not a part of what was agreed to uh, by ExxonMobil, but rather they've agreed to clean up the property uh, as they are required to do under the law, as they have been doing by a consent decree going all the way back to 1991. So let's make it absolutely clear, as we understand it from the letter we got just this morning from the Attorney General, the total sum of the settlement is $225 million beyond the cleanup that was already entered into. So there's no primary damage, primary restoration that's also a part of it. If it was, we might all be looking at this as in a lot different uh, way. Now, now let's talk about uh, attendance uh, of today's uh, hearing. Uh, the Attorney General uh, was invited, as was Commissioner uh, Martin. Uh, I respect both of those gentlemen. Both of those gentlemen spent uh, a significant amount of time uh, speaking to me directly uh, relative to, uh, to their position on this. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I'll explain to you why, and they can speak for themselves, felt that it wasn't appropriate at this juncture to, uh, to appear before this committee. Uh, and, and that reasoning was uh, that if they were here to justify in whatever way they were going to, the $225 million settlement versus the $9 billion that was put forward in, a, in the damages trial, uh, and the judge rejected it, then they would find themselves in a compromised position and having to go back to the drawing board and to continue to litigate this matter, having made their uh, opinions known. I don't know if I agree with them, uh, as they have made their opinions known, certainly through the, the press and, and through advancing this to the stage of asking for the settlement to be approved, but I do respect it. And, and again, respect both of the individual's offices and, and the integrity of the two individuals uh, as people. Uh, if they were here, I think they'd say it's the largest NRD se you know, settlement in the state's history. That might be true, but it's the largest problem uh, that uh, by far of, of any. Uh, and again, in, in the wake of the 14 years that, uh, that, or 12 years at least, that Exxon has put us through, you know, everybody can draw their conclusions after we get through, through testimony and then the next step of this. Once this is published under our laws, uh, and at this point, the, the, the commissioner has uh, limited to a 30-day review period. Uh, there is a public comment time. Uh, and I'm certain there'll be interest groups, stakeholders, and otherwise who maybe in a nonpartisan and intelligent way will weigh in uh, to the commissioner. The commissioner will be in a position to have to respond to that public comment, and that will all go into the evaluative process of the judge. The standard review of the judge uh, is in the public interest with due deference to that of the agency, meaning the commissioner. I'm hopeful, at a minimum, uh, that Commissioner Martin will make certain that he keeps very much an open mind as it relates to the comment that will come through this time, as it relates to the big picture policy issues that will come in light of this kind of a settlement. Now, one of the pieces of legislation and one of the goals of the committee uh, is to ask and to beseech this administration, the Attorney General, uh, and, uh, and the commissioner to expand the 30-day review period. I don't know how any intelligent person could reasonably argue that after 125 years in the making, after 12 years of litigation, and after a 55-day trial, to allow the public, the 9 million of us here in New Jersey, just a 30-day window to comment could be equitable. Uh, we're going to move a piece of legislation today that will make that number at least a minimum of no less than 60, expanding it from the current law from 30 to 60. But the commissioner has the discretion to expand that to 60 to 90 days, whatever he thinks is fair to allow everyone to have the opportunity to really look at this and make a comment. And it's too important not to. The the, uh, the, the second aspect of this, and, and, and again, I, uh, you know, I would like this committee to hear both, both from the Attorney General and from the Commissioner, but I'd also like to hear from the career 
attorneys out of the AG's office that have lived this for the last 12 years. I'd like to hear from the attorneys out of Louisiana uh, who have litigated this. Uh, whether that will be done through subpoena, whether that will be done at some point voluntarily, whether this settlement, if it's approved, will happen in, in hearings that will occur thereafter, it's too important uh, not to vet. Uh, there's another aspect that this committee is going to think about, and that is oversight. Uh, there was one of the recent uh, cases where documents appeared where DuPont, in a cleanup, said, and this is from them, we pulled the wool over DEP's eyes. We buried them in paper. Now, I don't mean to cast dispersions to DEP and not being capable of overseeing such an incredible, you know, project as it relates to just the cleanup component, but, but that's critical here. It's critical as to the discretionary standards that might be there and what the cleanup's actually going to be, and it's critical as to whether or not we've got the manpower and ability to actually look over it. If anything, DEP has been down. Uh, by a significant number of, of staff and other professionals that would have the expertise to oversee whatever cleanup is going to continue uh, uh, to occur. Um, another point that we will go through will be budgetary. Now, the governor's budget is out. I'm, I'm privileged now to sit on the budget committee. It doesn't speak specifically as to why, but this year's budget shows $110 million that's going to uh, be, go into the general fund that came from environmental cleanups. You know, $50 million that's going to you know, be used as, you know, as it should be for in, of that sum for environmental you know, cleanup, and, and, an, and another $60 million that will project to be attorney fees and cost. Now, you add those numbers up and it's 220 million. I don't know for certain, but I'm going to assume that there's no other major environmental uh, you know, uh, uh, settlements out there and that that must reference specifically what the plan is as it relates to this 225 million. And I think in and of itself that's inappropriate and we're going to move on a piece of legislation today that's already come out of the Senate as it relates to taking a more significant portion of anything that comes out of an environmental award and make sure it gets spent where it should be and that's to environmental uh, restoration. Uh, the last piece of what this committee is going to do, and again, I want to make it clear before I panic everybody that this isn't going to all happen today, is to talk about the NRD program in total. Uh, how many initiatives have there been by the Christie administration for the past six years relative to new NRD cases? What does our compilation of NRD cases look like going back to 2002? Allocation of resources versus the benefit of what's, uh, you know, come in relative to not only from a financial perspective, but the bigger picture, the bigger picture of how that's been used to incentivize bad actors to come forward and do the right thing right away. And, and to me, at the all conclusion of this, forgetting about the sum of money for a moment at $225 million, that's what this is really about. This is about to having, you know, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Exxon, won every step of the way, and then at the last moment when they were faced with those number of billions to take a step back. And that's just the absolute wrong signal for everybody, bad actor that's out there in the future.